All right, last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Steve Fry for our final talk of uh, the day. Take it away. Thanks. I'll try to be timely in light of the time. All right, so I guess, uh, first of all, I'll acknowledge quite a number of contributors to this work. Uh, the co-authors here are but a small list of uh, many who have contributed and the reason why there's so many contributors is this is a very multidisciplinary project that requires expertise across uh, many disciplines in earth system science. So we have uh, contributors. Oh, this is automatically timed. I didn't realize that. Okay. So there's contributors all the way from climatology and atmospheric physics down to hydrogeology and numerical modeling, mathematics, soil science, and everything in between, including data science. So we're looking at Canada's water resources and the Canada One Water Project actually draws ideas from documentation and you know, recommendations that date back to at least 2009 and probably earlier uh, and possibly going back to the 60s. If you take this kind of concept about a groundwater analysis framework uh, you know, deep enough back into uh, history. So we uh, drew some insights from this 2009 document from the Canadian Council of Academies looking at groundwater sustainability policy and ideas to kind of enhance Canada's groundwater management framework going forward, including under climate change. And they really emphasize that groundwater has to be treated in an integrated as an integrated resource. It's obviously fully coupled to a ground to a surface water system in many instances. So you really at a large scale, you can't look at groundwater independent of surface water and vice versa. And unbeknownst to a lot of the surface water modeling community, not to throw any darts to the surface water modelers, but they tend to disregard the influence of groundwater on our surface water system. And when you're looking at water sustainability under climate change, the role that groundwater plays in sustaining our surface water flows is going to be critical and a key part of any analysis. And we continue to beat the drum to try and get that point across. So anyway, that's my little rant about the surface water modelers. I won't go any further with that. Uh, they also in this document press on about the importance of looking at climate change scenarios when assessing groundwater resources and not just one. And we all know now an, an ensemble approach is the way to look at climate change just because of the uncertainty. So we take that into account. They're also advocating for a decision support tool. So not just doing the science, but translating the science into data sets and tool sets that can be used to better manage decision making and public policy, hopefully going forward. And part of that decision support framework includes communication and we're becoming more and more aware of how important it is to be able to can communicate the types of science that we're generating into like digestible tidbits that the rest of the world can actually use. And there's, I think, a coming together of the policymakers and the scientists to hopefully better position ourselves for uh, you know, establishing water resiliency under climate change. And of course, all of this data and the models should be open access because a lot of work goes into building these data sets pretty hard to reproduce. You can see by the team we've got behind Canada One Water, a lot of like kind of siloed expertise, but when you bring it together, we put together these data sets that can hopefully make future efforts a lot more streamlined and uh, generally easier. So here's just a visualization of the different national scale data sets that were assembled to support Canada One Water. And I'll just make a note that all of this data now is harmonized across the country. So all the interprovincial data, the uh, the transboundary data across the US Canada border, both to the south and to the north, uh, climatology data, some of the, uh, the thermal the thermal data, it's all harmonized. So these data sets are consistent in terms of their uh, spatial and temporal fidelity across this entire domain. So now if we're modeling watersheds across basins, we don't have these disconnects and uh, hidden artifacts within the data when we're trying to uh, blend together the underlying data for the models. So a lot of effort went into building these data sets and they're all going to be publicly available. We're using them, of course, for the Canada One Water modeling directly, but it's all going to be 
publicly available to support future modeling initiatives, either with the Canada One Water models used by others or just for what other applications people can envision. So a lot of climatology data was assembled. Uh, and when we're doing large scale regional groundwater surface water modeling, a lot of effort has to be put into the climatology because there's a lot of drivers on the interactions between groundwater and surface water, the land surface and the atmosphere. So thermal aspects of the land surface, so active layer dynamics, uh, permafrost extent, uh, the freeze thaw, and the evolution of the snowpack on an annual and interannual basis. Uh, it, it all has to be taken into account. And we also need potential evapotranspiration. So ET, evaporation and transpiration, is a major driver on the water cycle across the country. In some parts, it, some parts of Canada, it makes up you know, upwards of 95% of the annual water budget, even more in an extreme drought. So all of these data sets now have been assembled uh, and vetted by people with deep expertise. Uh, they're being used and validated within the Canada One Water Modeling Framework, but they're all going to be pushed out for public consumption as well. And this is both the historic data that extends from 1980 until 2020, but also the future climatology data that extends through to the mid-century and end-century timeframes. So when we looked at Canada, originally under the Canada One Water kind of idea that we had, we thought about treating it as a single model. And this goes back to uh, you know, early work by Jeremy Chen when he was still a student of Ed Siddiqui's and did a preliminary paper on an integrated model for all of Canada. Well, we had ambitions to do all of Canada in high resolution, but then we soon realized that to have practical outputs from the model, even at these large basin scales, we needed to uh, divide the country up into bite-sized chunks. So we ended up with seven model domains that extend from about 800,000 square kilometers up in Baffin Island to about 2.3 million square kilometers in the Hudson Bay and Gava area. So these are the individual hydrogeosphere models. They're all using the same harmonized data sets, but they're individual models for the hydrogeological and simulations. And you can see that three of these models touch on Ontario. So this, this ties Canada One Water into the Ontario context because through the, uh, the footprint of the Atlantic model, the Hudson model, and the Nelson system model, we've got all of Canada covered at a, with these large basin scale models. And this just walks us through the assembly now of the Atlantic model. And we're walking our way up through the bedrock into the surficial geology. We've got the soils, layers. Uh, you'll see it's, it's a highly abstracted uh, hydrostratigraphic framework, uh, but at this scale, this is what's kind of tractable. And we know, you know, Southern Ontario has much more detailed hydrostratigraphy available. We've used that data for other applications, but if we want a harmonized and relatively consistent data set underlying these large models, we want data consistency. We don't have, we, we don't want to have parts of these models which potentially have much more data fidelity than other areas. We want consistency. So that's why we've got kind of an abstracted uh, hydrogeology uh, in the context of what you might think of in Southern Ontario. Uh, we've also built two versions of each of these hydrogeosphere models. We've got a high resolution and a low resolution model. The high resolution model carries Strahler order four and greater streams and rivers. So those are you know, maybe the size of the Grand River, slightly smaller. And then the coarse resolution version of the model is Strahler order five, and that would be, I guess, maybe the Grand River. So we have these two models for a couple different reasons. One is for testing. Uh, the coarse models run a lot faster than the fine resolution models. And we're also doing tests on the impact of model spatial resolution on simulated model output. So we, we are still working to understand the influences of model resolution when we're looking at regional scale predictions. So there's some, some analysis that's going on to assess the influence of the different uh, stream order uh, resolutions within these two different model scales or resolutions. Uh, there's a lot of calibration data that we can accumulate across Canada. So in terms of 
the total number of gauging stations for surface water, we've got upwards of 400. For the, uh, the groundwater wells, we've got upwards of 3,000. But when you look at Canada, that's actually relatively low density aging. And from a modeler's perspective, if you're trying to calibrate a regional model to 100 or more surface water flow stations and maybe you know 800 groundwater wells, that's, that's a lot of calibration data. But in a spatial context, it's really not that much. So that's why we're you know, using a lot of remote sensing data. And you know, John talked about the GRACE data being used for these types of applications where we need something to kind of benchmark the simulations against in areas with very little gauging. And that's where remote sensing is becoming increasingly important. <clears throat> so how well do these models work? Uh, this is just a kind of a national snapshot of our surface water simulation performance uh, remarkably well. And this isn't calibrated data yet. This is really, this is almost just out of the box. And amazingly, a lot of these stations have statistics like uh, model performance statistics that are relatively acceptable, even out of the box. So one of the benefits of using a physics based model is that you can gen you can rely on model structure as opposed to empirical tuning to drive the uh, the the outputs that you're getting in model structure. You know, that's kind of a, well, I guess we would look at it in terms of how well can you represent the real world and higher levels of model structure generally mean we've got the real world better represented. And of course, at this scale, it's still a pretty abstract tool, but it does have you know, certain components of the physical system that really do drive the, uh, the hydrologic cycle and groundwater surface water interactions uh, on longer time frames. So the types of data that we're generating and providing open access uh, to via the Canada One Water Data Portal, all the geology data that comes with uh, hydrologic uh, parameterizations, and we've mined hundreds of studies to get at the underlying uh, hydrologic, the hydraulic parameters for these different lithologies in different areas of the country. So that's all coming part and parcel with the data sets. Uh, that's both for surficial and bedrock. Abstracted, of course. So the caveat there is that that data is abstracted to the uh, kind of a map based uh, perspective. Climatology data. Uh, which is very good, uh, both for precipitation, snow melt, snow accumulation, and potential evapotranspiration under historic and future climates. Uh, the models are all available, so all the model input data files, and we're also providing the model projections. So the storage changes in the groundwater system across the country, uh, projected changes in surface water groundwater interactions across the country, and uh, changes in stream flow across the country are all being uh, disseminated through the through the data portal. And we continue to work to try and, like I say, translate the, this relatively complex scientific data into metrics and indicators that hopefully the decision makers and the, the policy people can incorporate in, into their analysis. So we continue to try and reach out to the policy people with uh, you know, collaboration opportunities. And uh, there's kind of a, a snapshot of the data portal. So you can go on, you can plug this data portal into your, your GIS platform and work independently of the, the web interface that we've built on the portal. Or you can download data directly off the portal and you can get that in either tiled or watershed based footprints for your data sets. And uh, streamlines the data access. And I should say that once you've downloaded one of these watershed data files that could include all the climatology, the model construction data, maybe even the model mesh, you've got the foundation there for a relatively easily built, fully integrated groundwater surface water model. And I guess we really don't have to dwell on the summary, but just to say we've, you know, we're, I guess, just about through the first phase of Canada One Water and looking forward to the second phase. There's a lot of data that's been generated. A lot of science is coming out of this and the data and the models will all be open source. And for anyone who's interested, you can go to this uh, Canada One Water website or any of the newsletters and popular press uh, 
information that's been generated. And with that, I'll take us to the end. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Do we have uh, any questions 